Today I used a drill. Got my honing tool and a mixture of kerosene and transmission fluid. This hole here that this oil flows through, but it'll flow a little easier and fall down onto the time machine, help lubricate it. I also radiused out these return holes back here. Oil laying up here in this area isn't going to do me any good. It needs to go down back to the pump, come back up through. Um, I've washed the block and it's degreased right now, so I'm going to take a little time. I'm going to tape some stuff off and paint it because I like painted engines. Ford's been putting these in for a while now with nothing on them. I think they look like crap. So we're going to fix that up. The uh, wind's really bad outside, so I'm going to talk from here, and I'm going to go out and show briefly what I've done. After I got done honing the engine, I wiped the cylinder bores down with transmission fluid on a rag so they wouldn't rust. I went down in and worked around with a pair of pliers in the lifter bores. The lifter bores can't rust either. They've got to work under very good tolerances and very smoothly for those lifters to go up and down. I uh, did a little painting because not painting an engine is just lazy. So I also painted the inside of the lifter valley with some paint called Glyptol. You can sometimes find it at electrical supply houses. It's oil shedding, oil resistant, bonds to the metal really good, and it makes the oil not build up sludge in there and makes it return faster. Plus, it's just kind of a cool deal, you know. It, it makes every motor look like a racing motor to some people. Anyway, it's... I also dressed out the uh, cylinder surface and took the gasket off for the head surface uh, with a wire brush very gently and removed that graphite substance that's on there from the factory. And then on top of that, I used a uh, 600 grit sandpaper on a flat sanded board you'd use for body work. And I just kind of dressed that out with a little water running on there and, and cleaned that surface up and made it nice. I did not gouge it or sand it hard or change the finish on it. I just cleaned it for the most part. I'm going to put MLS gaskets on this engine to raise my compression and it needs to be smooth and clean to go on there. A little bit better than the good old Felpros do. Take this piece and once you assemble everything you put it inside, I've already done one. When you go inside and this loosens you press it until it fits the bearing. And you reach down inside with a wrench and you tighten that and expand it until it fits inside that bearing with the rubber sleeve. Then you take a huge hammer, beat the crap, and I'll use a brass hammer. And it doesn't take much. And hold it straight and do it gentle. And just tap that bearing, press it in. go until it comes right out of where it's pressed in there I'm going to reach in there and loosen it and show you this one and you see what it looks like it's stuck on that rubber tool on that sleeve right now and all I got to do is loosen it and that bearing will come off that tool will come right back out the hole that's what those bearing inserts look like when I put this sleeve in, I put a sleeve inside, and I tighten this till it holds that sleeve tight. And these aren't too big, so they don't damage the block when they go through and it dries it right out. When I put them in, I'm gonna do the reverse process and press new ones in that way. I've got a bare engine that has been honed, cleaned, the gasket surface is prepared. I'm not gonna replace the freeze plugs. They look to be in good shape. <clears throat> However, this cam had no wear on it, hardly at all. And the bearings that ride inside these cam bearings had no wear either. And the cam bearings look really, really good. So, I'm going to replace them. 
because it would be half-assed not to. The engine's apart, the cam bearing should be replaced. They're the key to your oil pressure to the top of the engine. I have a cam bearing installing tool that also pulls them out. It's not a big deal. These are rentable, or you can find somebody that has one. If you have to, I guess you can carry it down to a machine shop and have them put them in, or like some people do, they just want to run it and see how long they run without, just don't replace them. But I'm gonna replace these because I like to do it right, and this is the way I want to do it. This is what I was taught. So we're gonna put cam bearings in it. I'm gonna punch those out, and then I'm gonna get new cam bearings. I'm gonna put them in, and I might even see about how they measure and fit towards the used cam that I'm gonna use later. I'm using a different cam as well. Okay, let's recap about where we're at. We've got a bare block that we've stripped down and cleaned. We've honed the bores. We've done a little painting on it, clean it up and make it protected from rust. I've gone through everything and assessed all the bearings. Now, there are bearings down in here that the cam rides in. And I wanted to talk about those for a minute. This engine had very few miles. It was in really good shape. And those cam bearings were in excellent condition. The cam rode smooth in them. When I pulled the camshaft out, where those bearings rode, looked really nice. Okay, it sits in there and floats on those. And those bearings are in really good shape. You're gonna see in a second here in the next video, me removing the cam bearings. And I'll tell you why. We've come this far and the cam bearings are the key to the oil pressure to the top of your motor. There is no reason not to replace these cam bearings. You can get a cam bearing tool from a friend, you can borrow one, you can use one from the renter loaner tool or rent one. You can even carry it down to the machine shop and have them do it if you have to. But I'm really suggesting that we replace the cam bearings while I've got this whole motor down. Engine, some people say motor, some people say engine. I really wanna see that we replace these because when we go back, we're gonna have a brand new engine and you guys are gonna be surprised at the small amount of money invested to build this engine like it's brand new. It's gonna run 100,000 miles hopefully with nothing but oil changes, a little bit of maintenance, maybe a few things here and there. This engine is gonna be serviceable for the dollar beyond belief. It's time to start making an assessment of the parts we're gonna need. We're gonna start by uh, working with just the bottom end. I'm gonna start making a list of the things I wanna put into the bottom end to replace it. Uh, of course, we know some of it off the top of our head and some of it I'm gonna to have to put on the list, look up. We wanna re-ring the pistons. We wanna redo the bearings. We wanna do the gaskets and seals. So since we're so low budget on this and the goal for this build is to have this engine run reliably for a lot of miles, I'm gonna buy premium gaskets. I'm gonna buy premium bearings. I'm gonna buy premium seals. Labor, cost of labor, is negated in this project, but it gives us the opportunity to buy better parts. Sometimes when we find some used parts along the way, we can do some even cooler stuff, which we're gonna see later because everybody wants to talk about a cam. Has it got a cam in it? Yeah, we're gonna put a cam in it, and we're gonna bump this engine up some. I'm gonna show you about measuring that later. That's gonna come when we start going back together. On our cylinder bores, we have honed these out. Now they have worn some a little bit and then we've honed them out. Well, we've taken our pistons and I'm gonna clean each one of these up one at a time, but I have one prepped and I've cleaned it. And now we've taken the rings out of these grooves and I've laid them out here. Here's the three piece oil ring. It has a top, a bottom and an oil distribution ring. And then the second ring one in the middle, you can see here or not, actually has a square return edge on it. It's very hard to see with a camera. And then the top ring is square on both sides. It would almost appear like it could go either way. We will find out later that that's not the case, but what we need to do is we need to replace these rings. This is one of the pieces we want to replace. And I want to spend a little extra money and I want to get what's called total seal gapless rings. Okay, so I very meticulously figured these numbers and figured them twice and three times. Then I wrote them down. Then I called up the company and I got a recommendation for the rings. And I told them that the ring on the top was 60 thousandths thick and that it was 160 thousandths deep. And I gave them a measurement for the second ring, measurement for the oil ring. 
they were able to give me a part number. When I call up Summit and place my order, I'm going to get those. Now I'm going to get these rings and they are not going to drop right in and fit because I'm going to have to adjust that distance right there inside the board. You remember inside the board we measured and it was 25,000 scap inside the board, top and bottom. Well, we want to change that number when we go back and be a little tighter, but we want to run it a gap that is recommended for this piston. We'll discuss that later when we reassemble. That has to do with forged pistons, hypercutectic pistons, and good old cast slugs. Depending on what you're going to reuse, you got to get the gap right or it'll swell and it'll break the top of the piston off right here at high RPM. Holy cow, it's hailing! In order to know which gapless rings I want to get, I need to know which ones fit this piston. Evidently in these engines there were six or seven different designs within just a few years of the pistons. And the rings were different, the groove, thickness, and the depth of the groove. What they did when I called the company to get a recommendation for a part number was they asked me to measure. Well first I measured the rings, the thickness of the rings with my calipers. Then I measured the depth of the rings, this way. And I wrote all that down. But then what they really wanted was for me to measure the piston, not the rings, because the rings have worn. So I used my calipers very carefully and I measured the gap on the rings in the groove on each one and I wrote that down. And then I took uh, my feeler gauge and I put a feeler gauge thick enough down in the groove like this. And then I set my depth on my calipers up against the feeler gauge like that. And I set that down against that like that. Then I was able to subtract those two numbers. Subtract the total depth. I subtract the thickness of this, which is a little over half an inch. And that gave me a true depth of that. The reason why I couldn't just stick that in there and measure that on that bottom was because that will not fit in the groove. So I had to come up with another way to do it. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about temptation. Okay. These bearings looked really nice. They were good. And I looked at them and I found out what size they were and I wrote it down. And these cam bearings were, man, they were just about like new. And look, we got an oil pump. We got an oil pump. We even got rings. Okay, I'm gonna keep an example of the rings off of one piston, okay? And I'm gonna take this oil pump. And man, I could reuse that thing. I'm gonna take the bolts out. I'm gonna keep them. Okay, don't throw away the important stuff. take these bolts out and I am gonna throw this oil pump away and I'm gonna throw those bearings away and I'm gonna throw the rings away and I'm gonna get that temptation to reuse bad parts away from me. I'm gonna show you a trick too. You buy a new oil pump, you get a high performance one, sometimes you get a bigger shaft. On the 504 to 302 is this little shaft twists like a little piece of candy cane sometimes when something goes wrong. So, we're going to take this stuff, and we're going to put it right here in the junk that goes. And get rid of it. And then we're going to work on our list of things we have to have, which I'm working on today. And if you'd like to see, I have cleaned up all of our pistons. After I got done cleaning them, they wanted to rust immediately in the humidity. So I dipped them in kerosene. We're gonna see how that does. If not, you can use diesel fuel. Diesel fuel's a little bit oily too, and it will put a nice finish on there. I also brushed down my crank, so it was starting to show a little bit of discoloration here in the weather in the shop. So I'm also gonna box this cam up. This cam is usable. This cam is not high performance. This cam was, yes, a Mustang cam, and it made that thing go pretty quick, but we're gonna do something much better. So we'll get to that later too. Anyway. Get temptation out of the way, throw away the bad stuff, get yourself ready to use good stuff. Let's talk about cylinder heads. 
This engine that we're working with came with some pretty good cylinder heads already. Now they're not aluminums, they're not high performance, and they're not fancy dancy heads, but they're about the best cast iron heads that Ford had on the 302, 50 family towards the end of its lifetime. You gotta remember this engine that I picked up here out of a 96 Explorer for $350 out of a junkyard was supposed to be the Cobra motor of the Mustang. They phased it out and went to the 4.6, the new engine, did something different. And they used up the parts in the last of the Eddie Bauer Explorers and some other stuff. So I got the better heads, okay? And so I'm gonna work with the heads that I've got because this is a budget build. And we're trying to make a high performance, long lifed reliable budget build. That's the whole goal for this engine. So we're gonna talk about cylinder heads a little bit. And I'm gonna show you something the old Cleveland Ford screwed up. Okay, when we look at these cylinder heads, this is the side with the valves removed. And we look down in here, we can see where the air flows in and out and goes through them. And I was looking at a spot right in here that just looked like it had some rough corners. Maybe we can see a little better like that. It has some rough corners. And I thought, I'm going to try my hand at porting or grinding or whatever people call it and I started in on one hole the very first exhaust port and look right there see where my fingers coming in there that spot right there I found water I struck through the water jacket it was thin there and I didn't know it the most dangerous tool in my shop is this tool right here it's called a die grinder it's got a little roto file on the end of it and you can take metal off with it. Hooks up your air compressor. And boy, it'll eat stuff up. Gloves, fingers, everything else. So I've got a problem here with these heads. But I tell you what, I'm going to take a little time. I'm going to put on some, some blues. And I'm going to get out my welder. I'm going to see if I can't repair that. They say you can. They say you can't. I don't know. But I'm going to give it a good honest try. And then I might get me a different tool and try to clean up some of these ports a little bit and make them flow a little smoother. The thing I have to remember is that I made a mistake here with an engine I had to set it aside for a while but I didn't get mad and throw it away and didn't jump up and down because in my shop I've got a little card that reminds me of something some old men taught me and there it is right in front of where I do my grinding on heads and work on stuff. Rule number 62 never take yourself too seriously. You'll also notice up on the shelf that I still have all the valves and the parts for each cylinder port on these heads. Waiting to be reassembled because I knew when I got with it, I would come back to it and I would give it another good honest try. Guess what? I believe I was able to weld the head where I ground a hole in it and I think it's going to hold. If it doesn't hold, I'm going to leak coolant into my exhaust pipe. And I will know shortly if I do that, it's not going to damage the engine. I'm going to give it a try on these heads. My suggestion would be if you do find an engine you want to rebuild and it's one of these and you do it with the GT40 heads, you don't have to touch them. They flow pretty good anyway. About as good as stock heads are going to. Or you might consult with somebody on the Google or something and do some fancy porting. That is not my forte yet. I'm going to get to where I can do it really well, but not today. I welded it up. I evened it out took a lot of grinding with my die grinder which spits off little tiny shards of metal and I'm wearing those little pieces of metal in my fingers my arms my socks my legs everywhere and it's going to be days before I get that out of my skin because that's like the most prickliest little cactus pricker things that you've ever had so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call these heads done I'm proud enough that they're going to work for what we want on our budget motor and we're gonna probably run pretty good anyway. I did clean up just a little bit and take off a few corners and I used a sanding cone instead. I didn't do any major porting, I didn't do any major work. No rocket science on these heads. Next thing I have to do is get these heads and get the valves to seat in them. So the next time we get together on the heads and start doing something, we're gonna look at lapping the valves by hand or you use some lapping compound and you take the valves and you spin them and make sure they sit flush in their valve seat to make a good tight seal for lots of compression
Uh-huh.